Texas Podcast Massacre contains spoilers and adult language. For more horror, visit us at our website at texaspodcastmassacre.com. Welcome to another episode of Texas Podcast Massacre. I'm your host, Nate, and with me as always is no one. That's right. This is a solo episode. Somehow, some way, Mitch picked a doll puppet themed month, and I got stuck doing a solo episode. The greatest trick Mitch ever pulled was convincing me that this... uh, this was a theme month that would uh, essentially be him getting to pick the movies, finally, not complaining anymore. Yet here we are, all by myself, as Green Day put it. And, uh, you know, we're just going to push on, push through, continue week three of the Doll of Fame uh, with another episode on... (laughs) <laughs> on this ridiculous, I must say, again, uh, themed month that the person who picked it is not here. So with that out of the way, uh, let's get into this week's episode. The I'm going to go with classic, semi-erotic, horror shaman doll movie, Suddenly in the Dark, a.k.a. Suddenly at Midnight, a.k.a. Suddenly in Dark Night. Well, that was something. Uh, Suddenly in the Dark, 1981. Korea, made by a company known, uh, Nama Pictures Company Limited, in case you were wondering if it was unlimited or limited, Nama Pictures, known for a string of erotic movies, along with a variety of war and drama films as well. So they really branched out, but this one falls firmly into the erotic camp. Uh, the premise on this one, as I guess the unsuspecting victim and host and doll uh, uh, of fame committee nominee member. Uh, the, the pitch for this movie is essentially there is a wealthy biologist who spends more time with butterflies than his family. Uh, while not spending time with his family, he happens to pick up a 19 year old girl on his travels. Sounds, sounds as uh, coincidental as it seems. Uh, whose mom was a shaman priestess who died in a fire. The only thing that remained was a doll. And the wife of this biology professor starts slowly going insane. Uh, Is it all paranoia? Is it the shaman doll come to life? It's the latter. So (laughs) not much... uh, (laughs) 
<laughs> not much taming of the shrew here. It is definitely the doll. But uh, before we get into the actual film, let me break down a little bit of information about this. Now, this is a 1981 almost lost horror classic from Korea. Not a lot of films that not a lot of lower budget, especially these, this weird erotic cult movie, uh, made it over to the U S this movie was first released on Blu-ray in 2017 by Mondo, uh, Macabro. I did look up the Blu-ray, not a whole lot of special features I'm interested in. If there was definitely would be added to the Natarian collection, but probably will not be. But if you're interested in doll movies, if you're interested in um, underrated classics with crazy psychedelic dream sequences and one of the creepiest dolls of all time, th this one's for you, for sure. Uh, the movie was released July 17th, 1981, only in... Uh, I'm just going to say Korea. It wasn't North Korea, South Korea. It's got a, it's got a time of 95 minutes on IMDb. It is a surprisingly high 6.6 .6 with only 354 reviews. This, like I said, this is a bit of a deep cut. We're going deep uh, into Daldom uh, to get this one. You can watch it for free right now, which is what I did on Tubi TV. If you don't mind a few ads, uh, totally free. If you go to IMDb, it is a link right on that page. So no excuse not to watch this underseen uh, classic. Um, some of the worst housekeeping uh, done in a film I've ever seen. And within the first 10 minutes, you already have basically two sex scenes. So if that sounds interesting to you, it's uh, one click away. The director on this one was Young Nam Ko. He is known for some other films that I'm not even going to attempt to, to uh, pronounce other than Korean Connection in 1990. M the majority of his films are not rated on IMDb, which I have never come across before. These are just a lot of low budget cranked out movies. Uh, he made five films in 1978. Four in 77, uh, had a nice, nice top off of five again in 76, 75, extremely lucrative going up to seven films. So you, you get the gist of what was happening here and, uh, it wasn't quality. It was cranking them out. Looks like 1971 was nine films. I thought, uh, yeah, 1969, which this guy was probably a huge fan of just based on, on his film. Uh, we had nine films as well. So th this person in the span of a decade made, I don't know, a decade and a half made something like 70 films. Uh, so y you would think normally, all right, he's just churning these out. This is, this is someone who makes, you know, 12 lifetime movies about someone getting poisoned. But for some reason, this diamond in the rough, uh, you know, made it uh, slightly into the uh, cult movie scene. And from there has grown a, a very small but devoted following. And I would probably include myself in that list uh, at this point because I was a fan of this one. Uh, in terms of actors or actresses, not a whole lot here other than young A. Kim. Uh, she is an actress uh, born in 1951, so when this came out, she was about 30 and ended up being in quite a bit of uh, Korean TV shows uh, and, and films uh, even until the end of her life. Pretty much the only actor that worked any amount <laughs> other than the other people in the cast. Speaking of the cast, there is almost no one in this film. This could have been filmed during covid there is no one in here. There are uh, essentially four credited people and somewhere around 10 to 11 total people on screen. There is the biologist, his wife, their daughter, the 19-year-old girl he transmagically picks up on the side of the road while he's looking for butterflies and brings uh, her to their house because they need a housekeeper. 
the wife has a friend and the biologist, when he comes back with pictures of butterflies, which apparently got him very rich somehow in this uh, alternate Korean universe, has uh, f- three or four uh, biology friends as well. That's it. There is almost no one in this film. It's essentially three people uh, in this one. And it's actually fairly effective for its 95 minute runtime. The, again, there's not very much information on this movie. Uh, it had multiple different names. Uh, as I mentioned, suddenly in the dark, suddenly in dark night, suddenly at midnight, there's a lot of suddenly, but it actually works extremely well into uh, the mental state of what happens uh, to the main character, um, the biologist's wife, uh, Sian He. So I'm going to say Suddenly at Midnight is my favorite of the three, but they're all pretty great, actually. Uh, it kind of reminds me of a Giallo uh, film title. Uh, speaking of which, some of the related films on IMDb for this are insane as well and probably worth a, a look uh, to. 1968's The Snake Girl and the Silver-Haired Witch has one of the creepier outfits that actually looks pretty similar to this doll uh, in the poster. So I'm going to go ahead and just recommend that one for absolutely no reason. It could be the worst movie ever made. I don't know. It's on AMC+, Plus, so go check that out. Um, and there's The Blood-Spattered Bride from 1972, uh, which looks which looks great uh, as well. I'm just recommending movies that have nothing to do <laughs> with the original movie, but there's nothing. So here we are. The storyline for that one: a young hugs a young young husband's sexual fantasies frighten his new wife and cause her to seek advice from Carmilla, a descendant of Mercala de Karnstein. Carmilla seduces the young bride and forces to, her to commit gory acts of mutilation. Again, uh, if this sounds like a movie you'd be interested in, there you go. Taglines for that one are incredible. The revenge of a young bride on her wedding night and till death do they part. So there you go. I, nothing to do with the movie we're watching, but here we are in terms of the <laughs> research I was able to do on this one. Uh, this obviously isn't a normal episode. I keep talking with no one interrupting me. So we'll just keep that going. Let me talk about what this movie is. It is a proto. uh, It's like an early horror film that is extremely psychological in nature. So Mitch isn't here to say, Oh, the movie should be all slashers and have no nuance. So I get to talk up the psychological aspect of this film I mentioned the taming of the shrew previously, Henry James's book. Uh, you might uh, have seen, uh, first of all, a million movies based on the taming of the shrew, but the uh, the classic Innocence uh, 60s film uh, featuring the child who acted in Village of the Damned, the, the blonde uh, boy, uh, I forgot his name in the movie, but creepy as hell. Uh, this is in that realm psychological, supernatural. Is she paranoid for this 19 year old young woman to be in her home that her husband randomly picked up on literally a butterfly sightseeing trip? To be fair, a little bit of paranoia doesn't sound unreasonable there. Uh, Or is it the extremely creepy doll (laughs) that she has with her that she sees in her dreams. It is a, uh, until the end, it is not quite clear which way it goes. And even knowing potentially, you know, the reality of, of what occurs, they still leave a little room for interpretation. I think it was definitely real and supernatural and it happened, but it does keep you guessing on which parts are real and which parts aren't because uh, she is an unreliable narrator. And there is a variety of trippy, 
a f- hallucinogenic, like 60s-esque, ha- like uh, psychedelic effects. Crazy cinematography, uh, crazy camera angles, a lot of out there, I would say almost avant-garde type work being done here. And it surprisingly works extremely well. Throw into that that this is a this is basically a softcore porn movie at times, uh, here and there with I mean the number of the number of sex scenes imagined in dreams or real uh, is you know easily six or seven, so you're getting up there. <laughs> with the percentage of the film that has some of these things to be honest it wasn't too gross if this is definitely not a good episode to be doing by yourself but i would say it wasn't too gross and didn't really detract from the film for me uh where in other films it definitely has but i would say not too bad it shouldn't scare anyone dramatically away um I will say the acting from the main character, she is very good. All the setups in the film are basically soap opera-esque, like confrontations and dramatic uh, fainting and, and some yelling and screaming. The setups, I mentioned in the Lifetime movie previously, to be honest, a little bit of Lifetime-esque. But the actors really go for it, especially the main character, uh, who's the wife of the, bio- the biologist, and the, the young woman, Miok, uh, whose mom was the burned alive shaman. Great acting on both sides, from uh, Miok being, you know, very a naive young woman to, uh, to showing a variety of cunning and intelligence where she didn't have that before uh, from the wife, you know, trying to keep it together, definitely having mental illness, either supernaturally (laughs) impacted by a doll or from her home life being shook up so dramatically and her husband being gone so long. Again, I cannot stress this enough. Butterfly sightseeing trips where he's gone for weeks at a time looking for butterflies, somehow wealthy from that. Uh, If anyone knows how to get wealthy from butterfly sightseeing trips and being a biologist, uh, please let me know. I didn't mention it earlier in the episode, but uh, tweet us at TX Pod Massacre on Twitter. Texas Podcast Massacre everywhere else. Hey, send biologists. There's got to be a biologist somewhere in our listenership. We have people from all over. Maybe there's some South Korean biologists. We definitely have some uh, some some fans in South Korea. Uh, let us know. How do you get rich? Um, uh, I can't imagine it's easy. I can't imagine there's a whole lot of butterfly biologists who are just living in rural mansions uh, with huge houses able to pick up 19 year old, uh, homeless people, uh, to be their mates. But again, Texas podcast massacre, gmail.com email us, give us a five-star review for all those biologists out there. Hey, are there other erotic horror cult South Korean classics that we don't know about? Um, I only know about one. So if there's any others that are good, I will not know them. Uh, email those to us. Give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, the podcast platform of your choice. We will review it, and if I could get Mitch on one of these things and actually watch this, it would probably be incredible. So keep those five-star reviews coming. Uh, Give us a call, 346-246-3143. Let us know what you thought when you clicked on that 2B TV link from IMDb and watch this batshit film. Um, Back to the review. So... Some of the highlights of this film uh, include um, one of the most ridiculous window cleaning deaths of all time. Yes, you read that correctly. Window cleaning death. Um, Where does the death occur? Well, everyone should know by now. If you're cleaning a window and you fall to your death, it's got to be the attic. Team basement. 
on this one for sure. And again, Mitch not here to defend addicts at all. So addicts are the worst. Um, when a 19 year old who's potentially trying to kill you with a murder doll, uh, falls to her death, it's gotta be from an attic. That's, I don't know if, I don't know if there's an attic lobby, like the milk lobby that could get some commercials going, but that sounds like a great slogan. Um, you want to fall, you want to fall to your death, but have clean windows, addicts, trademark. The, uh, the ridiculousness of some of the scenes is pretty crazy. Uh, the mom giving a 19 year old a bath she'd never met before in the first, uh, I don't know, 20 minutes of meeting her. A choice. Uh, there is a little girl who they have together. Uh, clearly the dad is absentee, looking at butterflies more than his kid. But to be fair, no one's really watching the kid. So <laughs> it all evens out. Um, there's a friend who at first says, hey, uh, your husband is this rich biologist. A lot of butterflies, you know, a lot going for him. Pretty big catch uh, for the young ladies. We're getting older. You know, you're in your 30s. You know, who knows what happens sometimes. Then a hot 19 year old who barely buttons up her shirts comes in to be the maid. Uh, very flirty, very suggestive. And that same friend says, we should probably go to a sane asylum <laughs> because you sound crazy. Get better friends is probably the main uh, moral of the story there for your mental health. Just have some better friends. Couldn't hurt. Um, and the dynamic between the two is, you know, is, is pretty intense. If you've ever been in a relationship that's on the edge or been around a you know, tense situation where anytime anyone does something and someone jumps down their throat, uh, that's part of this movie. It gets very uncomfortable, uh, interspersed with terrible, sexy doll nightmares and dolls moving and coming at you. And then you wake up in a sweat suddenly in the dark or suddenly at midnight. Um, it actually ratchets the tension up pretty solidly. Uh, by the end, you know, something's going to happen. Uh, you know, this woman is just on the edge about to lose it. I mean, vibes of, you know, uh, Rosemary's baby hereditary with just, yeah, there's just nowhere else. My nerves can go. Uh, for this character, something has to give. And it does with a Rube Goldberg-esque prying of a wooden board on a window in the attic, precariously placing uh, chairs and uh, and uh, crates for her to wash the window on. Why are you washing a window and basically a boarded up attic? First of all, don't go in the attic. You're alive. Uh, second of all, she's washing the windows just so eagerly and just pushes through the window, falling to her death very graphically. You know, it's not going well for you. So the wife sets up the, um, the, the, the young woman to be murdered. Did the young woman almost drop a flower pot from the second story onto her head on purpose? Yes. Did that same girl, uh, take things and plant them and make her think she's crazy. And her husband thinks she's crazy and try to seduce the husband by falling asleep on a couch with like barely any clothes on when he, when she knew he's going to come home and a variety of other ways. Also, yes, but you know, your, your murder plan didn't go well when the policeman comes. Yeah. You fooled him. Policeman fooled daughter fooled. She just sees, you know, someone's dead at your house, whatever. No one cares about this kid. So it's fine. Husband's like, Oh man, I guess, you know, she was, she was dumb. <laughs> I don't know. This guy's terrible. Uh, yeah. I'll just bring someone into my house and say, Oh, if you want her to leave, cool. Oh, she died. Oh, cool. Whatever. Um, she fools everybody, but not the doll. The doll is at the place where she died and the dreams get much worse. She tries to tell her husband. Her husband says, you're obsessed. You're terrible. I'm taking your daughter away from you. If you're not feeling well mentally and in a really bad place, best move from this dad, which he does for everything in his family life, leave. <laughs> so they leave her alone all by herself. And there is a extremely creepy confrontation where it's 
almost picture in picture the doll moving on its own. Extremely creepy. Um, uh, on this episode, there'll be a picture of the doll uh, on social media linking to the episode where you'll see how creepy as hell this doll looks. Superimposed over that in some of the worst CGI of all time, but still pretty effective, is obviously uh, Miyuk's character in white face paint, uh, just insane smile with a knife coming at her. Uh, she gets stabbed a million times by the uh, main character. Doesn't matter. Blood on her, just smiling, laughing. A chase scene. Again, you don't know if it's real or fake. Uh, or if it's if it's real or in her head, and it's extremely effective. It gave me vibes of the ending of Hausu, which is one of the best compliments I could possibly give a movie of this type. Uh, it really works. It's extremely effective. It's a one on one with a woman pushed to the edge, versus the incarnation of the woman who tried to steal her place in her home with the soul of her mother in a shaman doll from a mysterious house fire death coming to life <laughs> to attack a woman. When you say it out loud like that, it sounds ridiculous, but I promise you it actually does work. Uh, it's a pretty interesting and long and intense battle between the two with the wife essentially destroying the entire house. But stabbing Miyuk's ghost incarnation coming from the doll. I think the doll's a vessel. I don't know much about Korean shamanism. I'm assuming I missed a little bit. Uh, I missed a little bit there in terms of <laughs> what some of the, the symbolism and meaning was. But I think I got the gist. But she stabs it, stabs her and the ghost a million times and wins. Uh, you know, cut to black. Oh, hey, conveniently, after all the action and uh, and uh, help would have been uh, necessary, the husband comes back home, finds the house ridiculously trashed, not sure what he expected, with a wife he accused of having a mental illness multiple times, telling her to go to a psychiatrist or go to a hospital, then leaves her alone, comes back, actually surprised the house is a mess. Don't, I guess that's, it's one track butterfly brain, nothing else, no other lanes. It's just butterflies or I'm leaving. Like it's, 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 I'm leaving and butterflies or I'm leaving. There's no, there's no staying component to this guy's brain. Maybe it's cause he's just so dedicated. That's how he got all that money. Not sure, but comes back and his wife is sitting there, white face paint holding a, it almost looks like a straight razor, but more creepy, uh, which the doll had been holding the entire film, making it even more ominous. And she's just sitting there, not moving, uh, with the doll next to her, looking exactly like the doll. And that is the ending. Cut to, like, go to credits. Pretty incredible final shot for a film uh, that ended well and then capped it off with an incredible incredible final just look at her exactly the same as the doll the husband again it's not butterfly related so he's just incredulous what how what is this what happened just worthless so um ending incredible and i i get i mean the more i talk about it the more i'm sorry i mean i'm fondly recalling how everything went. So recommendation is go see it. Uh, but I'll go to a little more depth with the final cut. Final cut. <laughs> so I recommended the movie. Clearly, you know, it's going to be a good score. Uh, this I mean, solo episode. So my score is the average score. Uh, this is going to be on the higher end. This is a deep cut. The, Acting is cheesy in a lifetime film sort of way. Um, there's almost no characters in this film. It is just, it's, it's lighthouse-esque. Um, but instead of uh, birds and uh, mermaids with uh, shark vaginas, it's dolls and butterflies. 
Uh, I don't know. I don't know how much. I, <laughs> I don't know what more you could possibly want from that or how much better of a compliment I could give. So I'm going to give this movie. I mean, this was this was riveting from start to finish. Bad in a good way. Good in a great way. At the same time, I'm going to give this eight out of 10 falls from the attic. It is a deep cut classic that I hope some of you end up watching because I really enjoyed it and no one has seen this film. So if I could talk to to anyone about it, including my co-host on this podcast, that would be fantastic because it doesn't go Hausu levels of weird. So I compare it to Hausu a little bit. It does not go that level of bananas, pun intended to go watch Hausu, but it goes weird enough where it still works. It's not quite as off the wall or off putting potentially to some people, the sex scenes, just my, the sex scenes and the amount of them might be, uh, some of the just yeah, over dramatized soap opera s acting and scenarios might be a little bit of a turnoff. But if you're into some slightly weird stuff with some creepy dolls, um, uh, this is the movie for you. And as the sole committee member of the Doll of Fame nominating committee, uh, I hereby... In a, in a shamanistic way, uh, induct sudden, suddenly in the dark doll uh, into the doll of fame. Probably the probably the best contender, like uh, the the Michael Jordan or the uh, the Kareem Abdul the Kareem Abdul Jabbar of <laughs> of murder murder early eighties Korean uh, shaman dolls. So that's it. I hope this interesting solo episode uh, wasn't too ridiculous for you. If not, don't worry. Next week we're doing Puppet Master. God damn it. They can't, cannot win. There's just no way. Puppet Master, solo episodes, dolls. I don't know how I got roped into this. Uh, I, feel like, I feel like Mitch picked up a 19-year-old uh, young woman in a car. That was the Doll of Fame uh, theme month dropped it off in my lap and then just left. That's actually this movie is almost a 10 out of 10. It's it's, it literally describes what's happening right now. Um, but yeah, next week we will finish the doll of fame and be at fantastic fest with puppet master three. Unfortunately, fortunately around all of that, there will be good new films that, uh, we can tell you about and give our impressions. Uh, from things that are hopefully actually good. Um, so that's it for this week's episode of Texas Podcast Massacre. Uh, I'm Nate. I am not a shaman, so and I don't have creepy dolls. So that's a positive. But if you watch this this movie on TV, just keep telling yourself it's only a movie. Good night. Good night.